Hey, welcome to Louise's Bible Study again. Uh, there, are, I'm going to do two sections. First today I'm going to talk on healing. And then I'm going to talk on the second section. We're going to be talking on the spirit of fear. Uh, obviously the day before Halloween. So tune in. You may be interested to hear what I have to say. But first off, let's talk about healing because that's the track we've been on. First, we have to know several things about healing. First, that healing is God's will. You can't pray for anything that is outside God's will. So you first have to establish the fact that it is God's will for you to be healed. And so often people say, well, God put this sickness on me to teach me something. God never has ever taught any of his children anything through sickness. Uh, if that would be the case in the natural realm, we would call that a abuser, a child abuser. And God is not a child abuser. Matter of fact, he says in the word that if your earthly fathers desire to do good things for you, how much more would your heavenly father do? So you first have to establish a fact, where does sickness come from? Sickness comes from Satan. Jesus says that Satan has come to kill, steal, steal and destroy. And he said, I have come to give you life and life more abundantly. So there uh, we have the definition. Jesus laid it down for us so we can have a clear understanding who our enemy is. God is not your enemy. And I'm not going to be sarcastic here, but I'm going to put things in a level that some of you can probably understand. I am so not opposed to people going to the hospital. I am not opposed to people going to the doctor, and I am not opposed if you have to take medicine, because not everybody is on the same spiritual level of faith as somebody else may be. You may have somebody that say, I've never been sick. Well, good for you. Uh, I have. And so we're going to talk about some later on, uh, get into, dive into some of these issues that, and sometimes it causes people to either feel condemned or it makes them want to throw their hands up and quit. And so I don't, I don't want you to come to that conclusion. I want you to realize that we're in a race, we're in a battle. And uh, we win by what we know, and we win by how many times we're willing to get up when we're knocked down and keep on keeping on. The Bible says that Jesus is the Word. And John, if you want to look it up, says that Jesus is the Word, and He was, he was made flesh and dwelt among us. God sent His Word, He said, to heal us. God's Word is living. It is powerful. And uh, we, we take it for granted, I'm afraid. And we need to understand that we all get consumed with taking wonderful vitamins and all kinds of supplements and eating the right things for our natural body. But we tend to neglect our spiritual body. And our spiritual body has to have the same kind of nourishments that our physical body does. And so if you don't nourish your spiritual man, it's not going to grow. Matter of fact, it's going to shrink. And you're going to be the, the shrinking spiritual person. And you don't want to be that, okay? When I was growing up, I was taught to receive Christ as my Lord and Savior, which I did. But I was taught that that was it. I received salvation. I was going to go to heaven and everything else in between was sort of like, well, where the shoe fell. That is not what God has for us. And we have neglected to teach the body of Christ that salvation is just the beginning. And it is a process that we're in of growing up spiritually. And uh, if you don't have knowledge of God's Word and apply that knowledge and practice it, you're going to forget it. Um, strangely enough, I don't know why, but it's just something I want to do. I thought I was pretty good at math when I was in school, but I hated math because it was something that I had to do. And lately, my piano teacher is a math major, uh, actually he's a piano major with a minor in math, but needless to say, I asked him, I said, how about taking me back and let's start over doing math problems. And I want to go from uh, 
uh, doing fractions all the way through algebra, which we have accomplished in less than a month and a half because, you know, so much comes back. But when I realized that I had gotten into a portion of algebra that required me to fall back on some of my fractions, I was like, oh, wait a minute, I forgot how to do that. So I had to go back to the fractions and I had to start studying those again so I could learn to apply them to the algebra problem. What am I saying here? I gotta throw my hands up. I really wanted to the other day. I mean, we're getting into some really tough territory here that requires a little brain power, but it also requires a point of diligence where I have to sit down and I actually have to study and I have to go back and I have to look at it and I have to memorize it and I have to think about it and then I have to do it. I have to do the equation. Uh, what does that all have to say about the Bible? Everything that happens in the natural is comes from the spiritual. And you have to apply the same process in the spiritual realm as you're applying in the natural realm. Or you're not going to get anything from God. Because says God says that without faith, it's impossible to please Him. And He also says that anything that's not of faith is a sin. Did you know that? Probably not. I didn't. And so I had to come back and, and relook. And when I first approached healing, when it was given to me, it was a, it was like going from doing one and one is plus two all the way into calculus. And I was like, oh, huh? You, okay, God wants me healed, but how? How is the process? Is there a process to learn? in order to obtain the things that God wants from me. Yes, there is. But I want to show you some scriptures because everything we say here has to be based upon the Word of God. And so if you say, well, it's not God's will for us to be healed, let's look at some scriptures here. Because Jesus said, everything that I do, I do because my Father has told me to do it. I don't do anything outside of what my Father's told me to do. Why is that important? Because Jesus came to show you the Father. You see, outside of understanding and looking at the life of Jesus, you're going to have a hard time understanding who the Father is. Because Jesus and the Father are one. And they don't do things separate from each other. And so Jesus went to the Father about everything He did. And he said, the things I say, the things that I do, they're representative of the Father because I have come to show you the will of my Father. Well, let me ask you something. Do you think he just came to show them the will of the Father just for the time that he was here on this earth for 33 years or three years of his ministry? Do you think after he went to the cross and shed his blood and poured his life out for us that that was the end of all the benefits? I don't think so. Actually, that was the beginning of the benefits. And so we've dropped the ball because we've ended the teaching on divine healing at the cross where that should really be the beginning. Um, one of the first things that I want to talk about is there was a leper that came to Jesus in Matthew 8. If you have your Bibles, turn there. If you don't, write these scriptures down and go back and look at them. But in Matthew 8, uh, one, three, four. Uh, there was a leper that came to Jesus, and I think it's very interesting because he presented Jesus. He was straightforward, and you know, uh, sometimes we milly mouth around with God and say all the right things that we think He wants to hear, but we're not being truthful. As if He doesn't know what we're really thinking. I got a news flash for it. He knows everything you're thinking, everything, and He knows everything you're doing. You can't hide it from him. So he says here, And when he had come down from the mountain, great multitudes followed him, being Jesus. And behold, a leper came and uh, worshipped him, saying, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Now, I think that is such a phenomenal statement. Because basically what he said to Jesus is, Look, I know... You can do this, period. You see, the first thing we have to know is, is God willing? 
See, and that's what he came to him with. God, I know, Jesus, I know you're willing. I know you can do it. I know you have the ability to do it. But then he says, are you willing? You see, the two have to go together. And to, to be able to do something and then turn somebody away in need is not God. That may be man, but that is not God. And there's a difference. Uh, there was an example that was given to me one time when I was at Rama by one of my teachers, and it was like uh, if, if a, a person that was in real financial desperate need went to a banker who had the money and had the, uh, the, the, the ability to meet this man's need, to help him out of the mess that he had gotten in, and the banker looked at him and said, yeah, I've got the money and I have everything you need, but I'm not going to do it. And then you have somebody say that standing over here that heard the conversation and they take this person aside and say, look, if I had the money, if I had the ability, I would help you out in a heartbeat. Which one do you think would be greater in the eyes of God? The one who's had it and wouldn't or the one who didn't have it but would you see it all comes down to attitude and what he's saying to jesus i know you can but will you and jesus's response was hey dude put your hand out here and let me heal you because that is the will of god i am willing willing to heal you so that's the first step we have to come to realize that God is on your side. He is willing to heal you. If you take the attitude that it is not God's will because I prayed, if it be your will, Father, that you heal me and I don't receive my healing because that is not a prayer of faith. I'm going to tell you that right off. Faith is based upon the promise of God, the direct promise of God. And if it be thy will, that's telling God you don't even know what his will is. So you really kind of left it out there in limbo. And that tells God you don't know his word and therefore he's not going to respond to you. Because he's not obligated to respond to you outside of what you know of his word. Now by grace he may reach down and help you out of the mud puddle. But a lot of times, most times he wants you to get into the word and grow up spiritually. So you can stand on your own two feet. He puts people like myself and other ministers out there that lay hands upon the sick that they can recover because they don't know anything. But after a while, babe, you're going to have to start learning how to pray to God and believe God on your own and not always lean on somebody else. And so this is, uh, you know, if you say, well, it may, it may not be God's will, then you know what? If that's the case, don't go to the doctor. Because if you go to the doctor and you're saying it's not God's will for you to be healed, then you're out of God's will to go to the doctor. Don't go to the hospital because it's not God's will for you to be healed. So why would you go to the hospital and have the surgery? God is not opposed to doctors and surgeries and hospitals and he's not opposed to medicine. What he is opposed to is your doubt and unbelief. He will meet you where you are. He wants to meet you where you are. But if you're saying that it's not his will, then to go to a doctor would be contrary to his will. Do you see how foolish that is? I'm trying to help you to understand that so many times the things that we have said and looked at and taken for granted are really very foolish in the eyes of God. Now, I may ruffle some feathers here, but calm down. And I want you to think these things through. Because God is logical. But his way of doing things, hmm, it's not our way of doing things. So anyway, he comes to the leper. I want you to look at Mark 2, um, 1 through 12. And it's a story of a paralytic. Because I want to put together some components that uh, as we talk about this, we can see one thing that is prominently working in all of these instances. And, um, and starting with verse 4 of Mark 2, he says, And when they had come near him because of the crowd, Jesus was praying. He was in this man's house. Um, and uh, there were so many 
yeah, crowded into the house and around the house, and they had brought this paralytic on a stretcher, these four men who were his friends. And um, they had heard about Jesus, and they believed that if the, Jesus prayed for this man, he would be healed. And, you know, that's a biggie because this dude couldn't even walk, okay? So they brought him, and they, says, and they uncovered the roof. Boy, you know what? We all need good friends like this. How many of you have friends that are willing to climb on somebody's roof and take it off? Well, they uncovered the roof where he was, and when they had broken through, they let down the bed of which the paralytic was laying. And this is what I want you to take note of. This is very, in verse 5, it says, When Jesus saw their faith. You see, faith always has appropriate action. It's not enough to say you have faith. Faith must be acted upon. Okay? It's not enough to say, I know how to do a problem, but I've got to sit down and work all the different principles of that algebraic problem out to get to my answer. And so I have to put a little lead to the paper to achieve the goal. And this is what faith is. Faith is walking out what you believe. And he said, when he saw their faith. See, faith can be seen. And he said, uh, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven you. But immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they were reasoning thus within themselves. In other words, what happened was the people around, the religious people around him were saying, wait a minute. They were not as impressed with the fact that Jesus healed this paralytic as that would have taken issue with, wait a minute, how can you forgive this guy's sins? Well, you have to understand when we go back to Isaiah 53, the forgiveness of sins and the healing of the body go hand in hand. You know that? So that sometimes there may be sickness in the body due to an unrecognized sin. And somewhere this young man had felt that he had sinned and this unrecognized sin was holding him back from receiving his healing. So Jesus took care of the atonement right there and said, your sin and your healing is taken care of. And he laid hands upon him and the man got up and walked. Does that mean that everybody that's sick is sinful? No. But it does mean that there are times when because of our disobedience, we can open the door for Satan to come in. Did God open that door? No, I did that. I opened that door. But God didn't stop that door from, from Satan coming in because you know why? I hadn't confessed my disobedience. I hadn't asked forgiveness. The minute I ask forgiveness, God comes in. You see, there's a, there's a real key there. And you know, when we see some people sometimes that maybe are not being healed, you, you don't know what's going on in their lives. They may have unconfessed sin. I'm not putting condemnation on anybody. I was on my deathbed a year ago, and I can guarantee you, I confessed everything that I thought I could ever have done. Uh, you know, but I wasn't under I wasn't under condemnation. I hadn't committed any sin. This is another story we're going to go into later. But the fact is, that sometimes people have unforgiveness. They have issues in their life that they have not reconciled. And it will hold you back from receiving God's best. Okay, so we've taken up two areas, and we're going to stop here, and then you can pick up with me a little bit later on. And we've talked about the leper, that it's God's will. And we've talked about that faith uh, has to have appropriate actions. And so I'm going to stop here because it's the amount of time that I've been given by my husband who's pointing his fingers at me saying I have two minutes. So I just want y'all to know that I will pick this up again as soon as we can get it re-going. I love you. So hang on. We'll be back.